Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to IMCW's second Sunday Dharma series. Um, I am Tricia Stotler, and I'm the Executive Director of Programs for IMCW, and also a teacher here, and often a host, but not always, of the Second Sunday Dharma series. So I want to welcome you from wherever you're joining us. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more about our series, we're, we come together at this same time on the second Sunday of every month to welcome a... Uh, well-known Dharma teacher uh, to share their views on whatever is alive for them in their practice, in their life, um, and to have kind of a relaxed conversation and a time for you to meet them and ask your questions that you might have. Um, so in a moment, we I'm really honored to be speaking, speaking to Stephen Batchelor. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to let you know about the next two that are coming up as well. So this event is a fundraiser for IMCW, and we really appreciate your donations. So thank you in advance, and there'll be an opportunity to uh, make a donation afterwards as well. So on March 13th, IMCW Teacher La Sarmiento will be speaking with Tuere Sala about the possibility of living a contemplative life as a lay practitioner. Is there space for practice for what Tuere calls an urban contemplative? So that'll be a really interesting conversation. On April 10th, uh, really excited to have Zenju Earthland Manual Osho here with us to talk about her new book, The Shamanic Bones of Zen. Uh, she'll be giving a talk and she'll be hosted by IMCW teacher Aisha Ali. Okay, so thank you Miyako for the ASL interpretation. Um, and also know that I believe we have captionings on, captions on, if you need that, should be in the lower right hand corner of your screen. We'll also be taking your questions during this time. So if you look um, in your chat, you should see that uh, one of our managers is named Ask Questions Here. That's Shannon. And she will happily take your questions for Stephen. I'll remind you about halfway through again, if anything comes up for you. We do have some time at the end for those. Okay, so yes, without further ado, Stephen Batchelor, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tricia and Glenn and everyone who has <laughs> made this possible. Yeah, the team, the team. So the team. I, I know that a lot of people on the screen are here specifically because you're here. So they already know all about you. And others may just be coming to the next sun, Second Sunday Dharma series thing. So I would want to give just a little bit of an introduction um, for those who may not be familiar with you. So uh, Stephen is a prolific author of Buddhist type material, right? I want to read off the list of some of your books because I, I notice a pattern here. Um, so the book that we're going to be talking about today is called The Art of Solitude, and it's just been uh, re-released in paperback. And um, previous books, uh, Confession of a Buddhist Atheist, Buddhism Without Beliefs, After Buddhism, Rethinking the Dharma for a Secular Age, and Alone with Others, an Existential Approach to Buddhism. I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that kind of jumped out at me um, because they all kind of lean toward this, um, this Buddhist sense of the, the way you explore and experience life based on your experience, and also this kind of leaning into the Venn diagram of secular and that this is not just for monastics, this, this, these types of inquiries that they're really for everyone. So um, anything you would add to that as far as your intro goes? Did I miss anything crucial? Um, Former monastic, now lay person? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yes, I was a monk for 10 years uh, in Tibetan and Zen traditions. And um, also, I recently helped found a thing called the Bodhi College mm. with uh, Christina Feldman and John Peacock and uh, Kinchen Weber, and mm -hmm. that's kind of my main teaching base now. 
Gotcha. Oh, thanks for bringing up Bodhi College. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this book um, really grabbed me as soon as, soon as I heard the title of it. I kind of went out and, and got it, The Art of Solitude. Uh, and so I have so many questions for you that we're mm -hmm. probably not going to get to them all. But my first one is that it, it's such a wonderful exploration of this topic from your perspective as uh, a former monastic, then a lay person, then a husband, then a traveler, both psychedelically and of the world, um, a meditator. So what prompted you to write, and this book came out pre-pandemic. So it's, 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 people may think, oh, solitude, COVID, but it was really not related to that. So what prompted you to write the book at this time in your life? <laughs> Well, you mentioned um, one of the titles of my earlier books that popped out uh, called Alone with Others. Now, uh, that was my first book, uh, and that was published in 1983, so quite some time ago now. But when I got to be 60, which is now ooh, seven or eight years ago now, is it really 60 or 65? I can't remember. In any case, um, I took a sabbatical. I took a year off. And I really wanted just to take stock of my life and to revisit uh, certain experiences I'd had as a younger person. And that is where I then e explored uh, certain shamanic ceremonies with plant medicines, ayahuasca, things like that, because that's one of the things back in the day in the 60s that led me into Buddhism in the first place. I wanted to revisit that. Um, but I also wanted to revisit the ideas that had informed my very first book um, of being alone and being with others. Mm -hmm. And I found this then, 40 odd years ago, as a very good way of somehow expressing the core Buddhist principles of wisdom, which is very much a solitary endeavor, and compassion, which is very much about an engagement with the world. And what I was particularly uh, interested in at that time was how in the Tibetan Gelug school in which I was studying, how these ideas are somehow integrated and that, if, that uh, the definition of, of an awakened person uh, for Tsongkhapa, uh, the Tibetan teacher, is the, um, uh, the unification of what's called fulfillment for oneself, and fulfillment for others. And a Buddha is a being who has realized their own value, their own meaning, their own purpose, and also at the same time has lived a life which is optimally um, uh, beneficial for others. It's not, it's not an alternative. It, it, it's both are needed, aloneness and being with others. So this led me to consider going more deeply into the idea of solitude mm -hmm. here as part of a, a two book project. The second book will be then called The Art of Care. That hasn't been written yet, mm. <laughs> but that's the plan. I, I want, as it were, a, a dyad, two books, mm. one on solitude, one of care, both looking at them as arts, in other words, practices, things we can do that engage our imagination, mm. and our creativity mm. as well. Yeah. So um, the solitude book really began there with this kind of return to the past and an attempt to recover and to reflect on some of the key themes that have driven my own personal practice as well as my writing over right. those years. Yeah, mm, great. Oh, I can't wait for it. Will it be called The Art of Care? Yeah. It will be called The Art of Care, but you'll have to wait. Yes. Because... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we will wait. We will wait. We'll we'll reread this one in the meantime. So the definition of solitude um, is, I think, important to kind of establish in the beginning because it's. I, and I, of course, like many people do when they're reading a book, I was reflecting on how I experienced this, and um, mm -hmm. and it feels to me um, solitude is like this fundamental state we are fundamentally alone um i love this this idea that everyone has an inner life that no one knows anything about um and that that can be cultivate conscious and cultivated 
or people can be totally obliv oblivious to their inner life. And so um, when, you know, through reading the book, it just really, I, I was wanting to really put more effort into cultivating my own inner life and my own inner solitude. So the definition between inner and outer solitude is something that's relevant now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, many societies are now coming out of the intense um, enforced solitude. Uh, and there's a lot of anxiety, right? So COVID circumstances were an outer solitude. So outer solitude, meaning um, that it's just you're you're you can put yourself in a cave mm -hmm. in Tibet and sit there cross legged. But if your mind is a mess, you don't have you have outer solitude, right? But not not inner solitude. And so that's what COVID gave a lot of us. And um, it can be really anxiety provoking. Yeah. Well, um, I think COVID actually gave us both. It gave us it gave us outer solitude. We were physically isolated. You can't get you know that's it. Um, but it also introduced us to our inner solitude. And what we find, what many people found, I suspect, was that the, the, the their inner life was kind of chaotic, and they didn't quite know how to deal with this physical solitude. Um, as I'm sure you have read, I mean. There's a huge amount of data now of uh, mental health crises that have emerged during COVID, of domestic mm -hmm. violence being, you know, packed in with people you would probably otherwise not choose to be alone with in that way for so long. So it's really been an introduction to solitude in its totality and a recognition that, uh, you know, you can be alone and you might even in theory, look forward to that. Oh, wow, this will be great. Nothing to do. Don't have to go to work. Da, da, da. But of course, as Montaigne discovered that when he's built himself his nice little tower, and this is in 16th century France, retires from his job, goes into his tower, uh, starts to you know, practice, you know, look forward to peace, serenity, philosophy, deep thoughts and all that stuff, mm -hmm. is that he said that the first thing he discovered that his mind was like a galloping horse that went all over the place without any kind of rhyme or reason that there was total chaos mm -hmm. and that actually sent him into a depression mm -hmm. i don't know whether that's in the book but that he he, I, I, he this for him was extremely uh, mm -hmm. uh, difficult to cope with and so what he did effectively is he wrote himself out of the problem in other words he started examining his own mind uh, following some of the precepts of the uh, Greek, uh, Greek and Roman Stoics, mm -hmm. uh, Greek you know, philosophers, as it were. But what he did is he effectively discovered how to, what we would say, to meditate. He learned how to gain control over his mind while never losing the fact that this control is always very tentative. You can create a space of attention and awareness, but you'll become constantly bombarded by other inputs, both coming from your own psyche as well as from the world and so uh, montaigne as it were again has the same problem although his is self-chosen um there's also i mean inter interestingly th th there was a there's a there was a plague during montaigne's life too two plagues he talks about those uh, but <laughs> for him it plague meant not staying at home it meant going on the road and then getting out so he left bordeaux for about six months with his family in a carriage uh, and uh, drove you know just wandered from one place to the next in played written it's, it's beautiful very beautiful very moving mm. um so yeah um inner solitude of course is what is particularly valued in buddhist practice and uh, certainly that's one of the things that i've gained most from in my own practice is is, is learning to somehow gain some command some uh, control and control is perhaps too strong a word, but to be somehow at ease in one's aloneness, because as you say, aloneness is a condition that we are born. We were born alone. We die alone. You find in one Buddhist text, uh, the idea that fundamentally we're alone, but the paradox is that we are simultaneously always with others, even if we are 
you know, hermit in a cave in the mountains. We're still thinking, we're still using language, and language is never my own. It is always the language of my community. We are constantly uh, still living in the relationships that we have formed through our lives, even when we're physically alone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this inner solitude is about, you know, learning to recognize all of that, to understand all of that, and then to establish certain uh, skills like uh, focus like mindfulness, like, you know, different kinds of attention to stabilize oneself yeah. within oneself, mm -hmm. so that in a way, the outer solitude serves merely as a kind of a, you know, a framework mm -hmm. for cultivating genuine solitude. Right, right. Once you have the inner solitude, then the outer solitude becomes less and less necessary, mm -hmm. because your, your, your solitude, your, your, your monk's cell uh, is always with you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I would so speaking of Montaigne, I uh in in reading the book, I jotted down some of my favorite quotes. He has so many quotes that uh really stood out. So one of them was uh where he says, Retreat into your I think this is in the opening of the book actually, where he says yes, retreat the epigraph. the epigraph. Okay, retreat into yourself, but first make yourself ready to receive yourself there. If you do not know how to govern yourself, it would be madness to entrust yourself to yourself. There are ways of failing in solitude yeah. as well as in society. Mm -hmm. And that just, uh, yeah, strikes him as maybe uh, something he learned after he went into the tower that exactly. maybe he was not ready to receive himself there. Yeah, exactly. And, and I was, I, I, like you, I, I, I wouldn't have chosen it as an epigraph if I didn't think it really summed up what the book is all about, which I think it does brilliantly, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's basically it. Uh, govern is, is the word I should have used instead of control. Uh, uh, yeah. Who de soi, the, the governing of oneself. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a kind of autocratic control, but it's learning how to adjust and to balance the different elements uh, and aspects of one's life in such a way that they cease to be endlessly turbulent and anxious and and or else very groggy and lethargic in other words it's working with the hindrances in yeah 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 it, and it's yeah. it's what uh it's the discipline part of the practice yeah that the creating the space i mean so much of so many of us on this call have had the experience of uh you know registering for a silent retreat this sounds like such a great idea and we get there and all of a sudden we realize oh i haven't maybe set up the the right parameters to govern myself while i'm here you know certainly being in a retreat center mm -hmm. um can help wonderfully mm -hmm. with that um being kind of secluded with all of the things that you might need externally to help cultivate your inner solitude but mm -hmm. there's still the you're still working with your mind so and i i love that he says to entrust yourself to yourself yeah that that creating this it's it's like a a pact you make with yourself to flex the discipline that it takes to cultivate this inner solitude so yeah no yeah. that's ab that's absolutely right and um yeah i think montaigne in a way is a kind of a he can't, I find it very weird reading Montaigne because so much of what he says is familiar from my Buddhist uh, background. Mm -hmm. But Montaigne knew absolutely nothing about Buddhism. I mean, I mean, didn't even know the name, the word Buddhism, the Buddha. These were not known for yeah. Montaigne in 16th century France. It was a total blank. Yeah. He heard he was vaguely aware of the Brahmins who were just mm -hmm. spiritual people. That's all he knew. Yeah. Well, isn't that common that, I mean, I, I think, and um, I think that you do too, that this Buddhist practices in general are not um, kind of relegated to Buddhists. It's like awake people throughout time and traditions. This is, this is not rocket science <laughs> necessarily, you know, it's sort of what you notice if you're paying attention and that's that's what i personally what draws me to buddhism mm. is that it's not a belief system it's just what you notice is true if you're at all paying attention this is how the world works this is how the mind works um and so another secular ish person um 
that shows up sometimes in the book is uh, Rilke, who also oh, actually Rilke doesn't show up in the book. I, I, I you're, is, is, it doesn't? you're not the first person who said Rilke. In fact, Krista Tippett, when she in her podcast with me she mentions Rilke too but Rilke's you don't not talk there. about the two solitudes well I do but that's not Rilke's you know monopoly uh-huh uh, uh, Rilke right. isn't there I mean I I, re I regret that perhaps he should have been <laughs> maybe uh, he'll no. show up in care the art of care oh <laughs> uh, well uh, yeah clearly someone somewhere is pushing Rilke into my life I think that's that might be the case that might be the case well just because and, and maybe it's coming up for me because um, a couple of weeks ago, I officiated my first wedding oh. and it may also be my last, but it was it was quite a bit of work. But anyway, it was a lovely friend who I was committed to doing this for. And she gave me quite a bit of latitude with what to present in the ceremony. And I picked some Rilke readings about solitude. Oh. Um, it's a second marriage. so. I think both parties know that there's a lot of solitude in marriage. Um, but, you know, uh, so the, some things I wrote down from him, uh, he says, love consists in this, that two solitudes protect mm -hmm. and border and greet each other. Love mm -hmm. your solitude. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, he's pointing to that same thing we were talking about in the beginning, that if you're not aware that that mm -hmm. you're a solitude, then all kinds of negative repercussions can happen if you don't guard and protect that both for yourself and the person you're in relationship with. Um, and then he also says, you know, that uh, I think I have this right, that uh, sol solitude's great and not easy to bear and almost everyone um, would gladly exchange it for any sort of intercourse, however banal and cheap, for the semblance of slim slight accord, he's talking about how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. Yet it's kind of in this relationship that we really, um, as you were saying, we cultivate this internally, but we're in the world with other people. Um, one of the problems actually working both with Montaigne and probably the same would be true with Rilke is that in German and French, you don't have such a clear distinction between solitude and loneliness. Mm. Uh, they don't have two separate words. In English, it's very clear. Yeah. And no one would ever think that these were the same. No. But um, la solitude in French and einsamkeit in German generally mean uh, loneliness. So when Rilke talks of fearing solitude, he's probably... I would probably translate it as fearing loneliness, oh, yeah. uh, but this is not a dimension I get into in, yeah, in yeah. my own book because it's kind of a, I do dis yeah, yeah. I, I discuss it. To me, loneliness is the shadow of solitude. Mm, mm -hmm. It's the, it's that dark side of solitude. There is, you know, solid, you know, being alone, being radically alone, yeah. let's say in a state of, of extreme illness, for example, mm -hmm. or, 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 or when a partner dies and you're alone in your, um, this, of course, has a very dark side to it. We are social beings. Yeah. We are, our life is, is, in a sense, made up of our relationships. Right. And so when you lose that, yeah. uh, when you're cut off from that, for whatever reasons, uh, you experience your solitude as a loneliness, as a sense of loss. Right. And I think we live in a society that tends to see solitude as something undesirable. Uh, right. Think of the second most the second worst kind of punishment you can get solitary confinement so in other words to put you in a cell by yourself is not considered to be an opportunity to get enlightened right. it's actually to punish you in probably the most powerful way short of killing you so we it, we, it would be naive to somehow you know just to put that brush that aside that is a dimension of solitude and i think it's also what many people struggle with when they start meditating too. There mm -hmm. is the, mm -hmm. you know, you might you know, initially get this wonderful sense of peace and, and focus, and this lovely community of people. But if you go into, and you start looking more deeply into your inner life, uh, and anyone who practices mindfulness is almost certainly aware of this, is right. that it can release all kinds of demons. It can release all kinds of suppressed or forgotten uh, trauma, all kinds of things. And these are things that solitude provides a frame for coming to terms with your own experience of being human. 
Mm. And it provides you with tools, at least different traditions provide you with tools whereby to learn how to, to govern mm -hmm. that space. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think solitude in its deepest sense is equivalent to nirvana. It's, it's, the, it's the absence of greed and hatred and delusion. It's a state of non-reactive presence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I think, the genuine inner solitude. It's nibbanic. Um, and remember that in the book also, although it's not strictly speaking, I wouldn't call this a Buddhist book, to be honest, uh, because there's so much non-Buddhist material. But uh, it is the design of the book and the inspiration from the book comes from a series of four poems uh, from the Atakavaga, the chapter of eights in the Pali Canon. And that actually provides, uh, in a way, the, the, uh, the, yeah, I think inspiration is the best mm -hmm. idea. And that's, of course, a very early Buddhist text. But it also provides, through being four, four poems of eight verses, makes 32, which is the number of chapters in the book. And the book is then divided into four sections with eight sections each. So that, as it were, mirrors Mm -hmm. uh, the four eights, as I call them, yeah. uh, which are in the appendix of the book. It's not a commentary on those texts, yeah, but right. um, that very much creates both the inspiration and also the aesthetic, the aesthetic form. Right. Because The Art of Solitude is also a book um, that is modeled on my work in collage. Mm. Uh, in other words, it's put together in the same way that I put together collages. There are chance operations in the organization of the chapters uh, and all kinds of rather weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. But so this is a very experimental piece of writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, way. no, thanks. I, I have the Kindle version of the book and you mentioned the four eights, uh, which is really um, I, I had I don't know that if it's included in the Kindle edition. So this oh, is gonna, it should be. I know I'm going to have to go back and look, but this is going to be inspiration for people to go get the paperback. Um, but I searched for them anyway, and I, I found your rendition of the four eights, and it was really informative of the book. So thank you for for mentioning that. You know, one thing in um, when I was reading that stood out that I wrote down was that you were introduced to the practice of mindfulness after being ordained, after being ordained a novice monk. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That... I, um, uh, yeah, I was ordained as a novice monk in the Tibetan Geluk tradition uh, mm -hmm. in Dharamsala in India in 1974, I think in June 74. And then in July or August of the same year, uh, Goenka uh, came to Dharamsala and he led a 10 day retreat in the institution, the library of Tibetan works and archives where I was studying. So um, this was a, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity. And that was my real introduction to the practice of what we would call Vipassana or, or mind, mindfulness. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, that was amazing, really well. Yeah, was and it, it just, I think it, um, it caused me to like read it twice because you'd had this this sort of Tibetan Buddhist education and training, and then the practice came. I mean, so often I think about how we we want it, we get it backwards in the West these days. People who are coming to the practice of they want to meditate, uh -huh. and they want to. I think from you know I teach and I hear from students, they want to experience inner peace. The mm -hmm. touch into that inner solitude. And yet, like a lot of the ethical groundwork and things that really en enable us to settle into this moment um, haven't been cultivated yet. So people begin this deep practice of mindfulness, which is so everywhere now, it's maybe not taken as uh, for the depth that it contains. So when I read that, I thought, oh, you're, you become a monk and then you learn to practice mindfulness um and i loved how you talk about your experience with lee brasington and your jhana retreats do you want to say a little bit about how doing those retreats uh long afterward kind of informed your experience or your relationship to solitude okay but let me go back and just say a few words about the mindfulness my introduction to mindfulness um 
I became a novice monk after I had been uh, studying and practicing Buddhism full time in India for about two years. Mm. Now, during that time, um, I'd done a lot of practice, as it were. In other words, but in the Tibetan tradition there, you would mainly do con uh, reflective meditations. You would do uh, some tantric uh, sadhanas, some simple sadhanas, which is mantras and prayers and visualizations and so forth and so on. Um, and so I'd, and I would spend a fair number of time each day sitting cross-legged meditating. I'd also studied mindfulness in Shantideva. Shantideva, 8th century Indian Buddhist monk, wrote a text called A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Uh, I was actually translating that while I was doing the first Goenka retreat. And Shantideva, in chapter 5 of his book, uh, gives a wonderful account of mind, mind, mindfulness and sampajanya uh, awareness, um, but not in the same, quite in the same voice. Um, whereas when I met Mr. Goenka, then he was the one who actually showed me how to practice this in the way that we're familiar today. In other words, week long or 10 day retreats, starting with your breath, your, the body and da da da. da. The Tibetans don't do that. That's just not part of their tradition. It's not part of the Zen tradition either. And in some ways, these 10 day retreats and what uh, Goenka and Mahasi Sayadaw and others developed, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, um, was in some ways a reform movement, a revival. And it developed a form that fitted basically the kind of contemporary working life that people had. They were designed from the outset as, as much for lay people as for monks. And this was an important development in the reform of Buddhism in the post-colonial period. Mm -hmm. So uh, we must be careful, I think, also to think that mindfulness is somehow Buddhism 101, common to all schools. It's not. Uh, all the schools will recognize the importance of mindfulness, but only really in the Theravada, modern Theravada, will you find actual, you know, structured retreats and practices and a whole, uh, I think, a very, very well worked out philosophy and psychology of mindfulness that embeds in the Pali Canon. So what the Goenka practice opened up to me was the capacity that I could, you know, spend 10 days watching my breath, experiencing my body, my feelings, my sensations, and so forth and so on, in a way that had a transformative effect on my consciousness. And I think in having had two years of intensive study and practice was a very good basis for that. Um, if I hadn't done all of that, I think my experience would almost certainly have been quite different. Um, and I agree with you. I, I think to really benefit from whether it's mindfulness practice or jhana practice, you do need to have established a foundation of ethics, of foundations of not just ethics, but I think also to have a have clarified a sense of where your values are, what they are, and how you seek to live in the world, what kind of person you want to be. It's an ethical question. Mm -hmm. Now, going on to your second part about uh, the jhana practice, for all of my training in Buddhism and through all of my involvement in the Vipassana communities in Gaia House and elsewhere in Europe and America, um, I never met a teacher who was remotely interested in teaching or practicing the jhanas. And um, this strikes me as odd because after all, we have a very, I think, a, 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 very, a, 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 a very sound source in the Pali Canon of the Buddha describing how as a young child, while his father was at work, he was beneath a rose apple tree and he entered into the first jhana. And that was long before he renounced the world or became an ascetic. It happened to him quite naturally as a child. And it was that memory that gave him the clue. At this point, he'd been you know, struggling for about six years to answer these deep questions of human life. He'd tried asceticism, he'd tried these formless meditations, which he'd been very good at. But none of those approaches had worked. And then he remembered the childhood experience of the jhana. Now, and then he said, this is the way to go. And so he follows that 
And that's what leads him to awakening. Now, if we're to take that text seriously, and I do take that text seriously, then one wonders, well, why are the jhanas not taught today? Why is there such, and there's also a kind of suspicion about the jhanas. They're going to get you sort of happy, and you certainly don't want that. Otherwise, you'll get attached to it. So there's, the, there's that. Um, and it's a tradition that's kind of faded away. So, uh, and I, I had those prejudices myself. Without doubt, uh, I, I didn't see the point of it. And again, this was one of this taking the year out was about not only about you know going back to my sources, but also exploring elements of Buddhism about which I didn't know much, and of which I actually probably had you know some reservations. I had known Lee Brasington for many years. Uh, he had actually sat retreats with my wife and myself mm -hmm. in America. Um, and we got to know each other personally quite well and he'd always encouraged me to do these things and so i had the opportunity now and i did two uh two seven day retreats with lee one in england one in portugal which i describe in the book and um uh, this was a very important experience for me um and it didn't result in what i expected nor did it result in what the text said i should expect in other words, to go through these four jhanic states and the, each one is very clearly described and different elements fall away. I think that's frankly uh, um, kind of, you know, that's, that could, I think that's a useful sort of frame, but I would be careful in taking that too literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in any case, I, I never managed to sort of replicate what the texts tell me I should. But what did, uh, what these retreats did give me was a much stronger sense of how uh, meditation or practice in general needs to be embodied. Mm -hmm. I've already thought of jhanas and embodiment as going yeah. together so much, but they do. And again, that's what the texts say, that well-being or, 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 or joy infuses the whole body from head to foot. It's, mm -hmm. it's about a really somatic dimension of experience, which really is uh, sort of an, uh, an amplification of the well-being that naturally comes when the mind settles down, becomes clear, becomes focused. But we normally somehow are not alerted to that sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. yeah. What practice does is it says, look, you're, this, you know, when the mind gets still and calm, you feel good. There is a positive affect, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual. And I think what the jhanas are doing are basically learning, allowing us to incorporate that sense of well-being, to refine it, to heighten it, and to integrate it into a more embodied form of practice. And I did just those two retreats with Lee. But since then, uh, that aspect of my daily meditation has actually become much more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I bring this element of the practice up because um it seems that when we're on the cushion and when we're engaged in these practices what we're really doing is it's like we're we're cultivating the ability to stay present with our own experience mm -hmm. and which is the doorway into solitude into being comfortable with our inner solitude mm -hmm. and so one of the your quotes from the book um you say a natural consequence, talking about, I think your jhana practice, a natural consequence of disentangling oneself from the habit patterns and mood swings that bedevil us. Like this, this is like the meditation practice. Um, and so that's what Montaigne was talking about, like working with in the tower and everyone on the screen has worked with when they sit on the cushion or attend a class. Um, and so my, my last quote from you, I think, was mindfulness helped to, mindfulness helped to shape the inner contours of my solitude. I love yeah. that, yeah. the inner contours of my solitude. Mm -hmm. Just uh, the ability to pay attention in this embodied way. That's what I kind of read from that. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm fond of that sentence too, uh, although that might sound a bit, <laughs> egotistic 
Um, but yeah, that's what I think meditation is about. It's about shaping and refining the, 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 the inner contours of who you are, actually, mm. yeah. not just your mind, whatever that is. Mm. But it's really about learning to, uh, to embrace uh, your inner life, uh, to stabilize your attention, to become more attuned and more alert to what rises up within your emotions and thoughts and feelings and so forth. Mm. Uh, and mindfulness is really the way in which we somehow uh, govern and organize uh, mm -hmm. these inner experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember as a child, actually, I, I don't know whether this is in the book, but um, I remember as a young child, probably seven, eight, nine years old, and uh, being extremely puzzled as to why all the classes I went to at school talked about everything except what mattered most probably to myself and to most of my friends and what things we talked about in the playground basically how we felt you know what it was like to be me what it was like to suffer and to feel ang anxiety and, and 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 insecurity and longing and desire uh, this was just not there in western education and maybe it's there's more of it now i don't know but i found this extremely weird uh, mm -hmm. to be talking about things that didn't really matter mm -hmm. and to ray and, and, the, and also the sort of the, the subtext being that the, you know, there's a, these issues are taboo. Mm -hmm. There's no room or there's no place to raise these yeah. topics. There's a kind of a, a collective omerta yeah. around this stuff. Yeah. What really, I think, engaged me with Buddhism was meeting monks and also just ordinary lay Tibetan people who clearly uh, had you know, a much more conscious and uh, alive relationship to their own interiority. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah that, I, that really was what clicked. That's what connected me with the Dharma, basically. Yeah. How do these people do this? What are the, f the practices? What are the philosophies? How do you live in such a way? That's what I wanted to mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're, you're segueing naturally into um, our first question, which is also a reminder for me to remind you, everyone watching, that if you do have a question, um, to uh, put it in the chat to ask questions here. So yeah, this first question, um, it's so important, but solitude seems to be becoming more and more distant in this world of technology. We're constantly plugged in. Kids don't even experience boredom anymore. Is there any hope for future generations? <laughs> it's a small topic. I don't um, know. I think there's always hope for future generations. <laughs> I, I, I know that the, 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 that's being asked in a slightly ironic way, but uh, I, it's 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 important. I'm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough now to have been through two or three generations of human beings. And um, I, each generation has the same voices of concern that I can recall, you know. Um, funnily enough, I read, I was reading for some reason an old book by Alan Watts, mm -hmm. uh, written in the 1950s called, uh, what was it called? I forget now. The Wisdom of Insecurity. Someone suggested I read it because it seemed to be tied to my idea of solitude and so on. So I started reading this book and um, it's OK. But what was one of the, <laughs> it's not great stuff, frankly. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's 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 very day, dated. And one of the funniest things in it was he was, was he started going on a bit of a tirade about teenagers and saying people, all these young people nowadays, they all go around everywhere they are. They've got a transistor radio to their ear. And um, I thought, well, thank God you didn't live to the experience the iPhone 13, Alan. Uh, things have moved on. But the point is, it's the same. It's the same concern. You know, how could a child ever have a future if they've got a transistor radio to their ear? Uh, this is a concern, an understandable concern, perhaps, but one I think we should not be. We should be careful not to uh, to, to charge too strongly. Um, every generation of young people have to come to terms with the world that presents itself to them at their time and in the 20th century and as we move into the 21st we really 
get a sense of these technologies developing with such incredible rapidity and sophistication that we sometimes feel as though this is just a tidal wave that's taking us along and over which we have no real control. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's been a concern for, in a different scale, uh, for a long time. Um, so I do think it's a problem that uh, we find it very difficult to deconnect. It's made the experience of doing a retreat completely different. And now we actually have to enforce rituals or have rules about devices on retreat. In other words, you can't really go on a retreat and bring your your device with you and switch it on because that's what keeps you not on retreat. So yeah, that's you know, clearly has to be processed in the experience of retreat. Um, but at the same time, this shouldn't be forgotten too, it's through these meditation apps that um, people discover meditation. Uh, I was giving a course during COVID and one of the participants for the first time ever was from Islamabad, a Pakistani fellow from a Muslim country. And he was really interested in Buddhism. He's read my books. So he was very, very keen. And afterwards I asked him, I said, are there many people in Pakistan who have these interests? And he says, oh yeah. Uh, he says that everybody's using these meditation apps because they're not they're not sort of religious. They're not, you know, there's no way a church or a, some religious authority can have any control over them. They're totally secularized, but everybody knows they come from Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And so this has been a way, you know, this same thing that we're complaining about with our kids is actually opening up uh, access to material that otherwise these people will pro probably not come in contact with. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's true. I, the, the, the word boredom jumped out at me too. Um, that, I mean, I have three teenagers. You uh -huh. might have heard them eating their breakfast in the background. Um, and boredom is, uh, it's, I don't know. There's always something at arm's reach. There's a distraction right there. And it strikes me as someone who did not grow up with these devices that boredom was very generative for some of my inner, you know, questioning and seeking and all of that. Um, and so I don't know, I, I do remember my grandmother freaking out about Elvis Presley. So I, I try to remember that um, with my father. I try to remember that as my kids with the phones and that it, every generation has its thing. Um, and it also strikes me what you're saying, um, about it it could be that the grown-ups in these kids lives so i don't know my oldest is a, about to turn 18 a senior in high school so he really was of that first generation of kids that grew up with these devices mm -hmm. and the parents around these kids started to reach out more for things like mindfulness mm -hmm. in order to counterbalance that to mm -hmm. sort of create some inner uh, solitude for their kids. So, um, yeah, that it is an interesting thing how we're even here together from all over the world, uh, to, uh, yeah, we can be together because of this technology and maybe, and, you know, mindfulness in the schools is now a thing. So, um, it, uh, you know, to counterbalance the classroom management is a huge problem in, yeah in schools these days and so um yeah yeah just something that that crosses my mind um yeah oh yeah jill saying that she uh she saw me shoot the the death stare to the kid eating cereal in the background <laughs> thank you jill maybe another parent um another question what are some simple practices for bringing inner solitude into our daily lives rather than carving out time for days or weeks of retreat? Well, um, I think Thich Nhat Hanh, who, as we probably must be aware by now, died a couple of weeks ago, which I would like to honor his memory uh, as being really one of the sort of founding fathers, really, of the whole mind, mind, mindfulness movement. Mm -hmm. But one of the practices that he encouraged in his community was basically to, uh, it's very simple, actually, each time you hear a bell, it could be a telephone, a church bell, a 
police car going by, each time you hear a bell, you take three breaths. So instead of the phone rings and you just, you grab it, the phone rings, you breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out, then you take the phone and you do that. So in other words, to create Please stand by. Stephen, if you can hear us, we have, you have frozen. Oh, come back. Shoot. All right, well, I think I can, until he comes back or if he comes off and comes back, I think what he was saying um, about Thich Nhat Hanh is how he really emphasized the mundane things in our lives, in our everyday lives, as being um, the, the stuff of our mindfulness practice. They're the reminders to be mindful so that our everyday lives actually contain quite a bit of opportunity. Um, and hopefully he's going to try to come back and Glenn's going to let him in. Um, yeah, this is a, a perfect opportunity for three breaths. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that it's even in the, the things we do in our daily lives with our own families. Because as Stephen was saying, we, we're solitary beings, yet we're almost always in community. So we're always cleaning up after ourselves. We're always doing the laundry. We're always standing in line at the grocery store. And that these can be opportunities to really practice that embodied sense of, of the mindfulness practice as it comes up. Um, and so I don't, I, I, until he comes back, I'll just tell you while he's not here that one of the things that Stephen and his wife Martine have really I think, and in this Bodhi College endeavor that he's um, started, are really um, trying to shine a light on how you do not have to be a monastic or go on, you know, months of retreat or be in your monk's cell in order to really, truly cultivate this inner sense of solitude. And so, um, yeah, that's as I was reading off the titles of his books, it really kind of struck me, um, you know, Buddhism without beliefs, uh, uh, confession of a Buddhist atheist. Yeah, really taking the, um, maybe the heavy religious um, dogmatic or uh, approach to this practice and making it come alive for us in our everyday lives. Um, all right. Glenn, do you want to give me an update? Have we lost Stephen? We have a couple more questions. Okay. We have not heard back from Stephen, but, um, we do have another question that's in the chat here, um, from Jill, uh, can you speak to how you think therapy is related to setting the foundation for mindfulness? And perhaps that's why we Westerners are more prepared. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the question that I had for Stephen around Westerners doing this backwards uh, is kind of that's kind of where I, what I was thinking about when that question came up for me is we're very cerebral. Um, we hear something and we want it. We read something or we notice that someone else has this great peacefulness about them and we want that too. Um, and so whether, um, and often it is therapists who are prescribing mindfulness practice, come to a mindfulness-based stress reduction or some other kind of secular class and learn these practices, really what, uh, without what Stephen was referring to as this ethical training 
um, and setting up that framework to be able to receive yourself, what that Montaigne quote from the beginning, um, how to govern yourself within this, uh, within this solitude. So yeah, I think that the mental health component of these practices is, is huge for, for Westerners. And yeah, I guess that gives us some, um, some practical applications as well, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. The questions keep coming in now and I'm, I'm sure they're for Steven, but let me see if there's anything else that, uh, that we can address. Yeah, this would be a great question uh, for Stephen. Uh, interbeing the oneness and solitude. Someone's asking, um, can you speak to the relationship between interbeing or the oneness of all and solitude? And this is a great one for Stephen. But since I've been really kind of engrossed in this book, and I certainly don't want to speak for him, but um, he kind of alluded to pretty strongly in the beginning of our conversation how his approach to and his his wanting to talk about solitude is not the end point. Uh, it's not so that we get really comfortable with being alone in our interior life that we become navel gazers, uh, but it's that so that we can take those learnings. The, what he called the inner con our inner contours back out into the world. Stephen Bachelor has entered the waiting room. I just admitted him. Hold on. Hold on. Now we'll ask him the same question and we'll see if he has a different answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hold on. Stand by. A three breath pause. That's my dog snoring in the background, not my children in case you can hear that. Okay. It's the wonderful thing about being meditators that we're comfortable with the unknown. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry, the, the whole village has lost power. Oh, well then, Patricia, yes, um, I can hear you. We've got dark, there's no lighting. Um, Okay, so yeah. um, uh, this is uh, uh, all right. So you know, Stephen. Continue. Sometimes, if um, you turn I'm off, basically your... having to hot. Yeah, got you. Sometimes your audio might come through better if your video is not on. I hate to take away your face. Okay, I should we try it a little bit? Video. Okay. Yeah. Your audio is no, no, just a little okay. rough. Um, yeah, let's try it. Um, okay. I can't. Uh, the, um, I can't see how to switch the video off. That's the pro oh, video. Stop video. Oh, it's better. Okay, yeah. is that better? It, I think your audio yeah. is better. Thank you. Okay. So, um, questions okay. have been coming in, and I've been trying to. Um, reflect on them a little bit, but someone asked a question, could you speak to the relationship between interbeing, uh, a Thich Nhat Hanh uh, word, or the oneness of all and solitude? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, think, I think solitude, if we think of it as a contemplative space, is 
uh, a space that is not driven by one's uh, attachments and fears and likes and dislikes, one's opinions, one's belief. It's a kind of open, unfabricated, unstructured uh, state of presence, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways in which we could talk about that. Um, in, and the way we talk about it will be informed by the religious or philosophic traditions to which we belong. So um, some will perhaps see this stilling of the mind, this opening of the mind as uh, revealing the, you know, the interconnectedness of all things, the, you know, the, the, the interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh speaks. Others perhaps coming from a more mystical or perhaps uh, Advaita type background might think in terms of oneness of all things uh, and other possibilities too. So I don't really think any of these uh, particular ideas is more suited to the experience of solitude than any other. Mm -hmm. But you've all frozen. I don't think you heard that. I heard. Yes, we can hear you. I heard you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before that was sent by Peter. Um, and we'll see if you. Uh, <sighs> all right. So, hmm. Yeah, this was one I, I really wanted Stephen to answer and not have uh, me try to transpose. All right, why don't we take a break? I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get back with us based on the situation he described in his village. So, yeah, let's, why don't we just uh, do a close? Can you hear, can you hear me now? Oh, what? And he's resurrected. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. This is by far the most interesting second story in the series. You. I don't know how long it'll last, <laughs> but we lost contact. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, why don't we why don't we go to our our closing meditation? <laughs> Because I want you to be able to do it. Yeah, I want Stephen to be able to lead our closing meditation. Uh, I'm a... Give me a question and I'll see what I can do with it. Yeah. Can you, Stephen, can you, can you lead our closing meditation? Because you're, I don't think your audio is good enough to, to do the back and forth. Okay. Maybe we should do that now. Yes, let's do the closing meditation. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Ah, oh, I can see you now too. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about this, everybody. It's out of my control, so I don't, nothing I can do about it. No worries. Um, I'm very sorry. It hasn't happened before like this to this extent. But let's conclude then with a few moments of silent uh, reflection. Um, Maybe close your eyes or half close your eyes. Take a few breaths. Feel the breath in your body. Let it come and go in its own speed, it's in its own rhythm. And just stop. And be conscious of the rising and the passing of the breath, sensations in your limbs and in your torso, the sounds around you wherever you are. 
And just for a few moments, recognize how your awareness of all this is not reactive. It's simply a presence of mind. And just stay in that presence of mind. Being fully aware, but without running a story or a commentary on what's happening. And if you do that, then include that in your awareness as well. Now I'm telling a story. Now I'm commenting. So always to keep mindfulness one breath wider than whatever is going on within it. If you get distracted, include that in your awareness as well. That ultimately there are no distractions. There's nothing you cannot include in your mindful attention of each moment. Thank you all very much. Uh, It's been delightful to be with you. It's been lovely talking with you, Tricia. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to Glenn and all the others who have been helping, to Miyako for the ASL translation, Mm. and to you for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take any more. Yeah, no, thank you so uh, much, Stephen. Yeah, this has been really wonderful. Yeah, we 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 don't mind if we have glitches here. This is it's okay. sort of real life coming through, and if uh-huh. anyone's prepared to deal with the changing nature of things, it's us. So it's all good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very you much. to everyone who was here for joining us for your donations to this series. I hope you can join us again for future. Uh, and please note that we do have a, um, a, a coupon, I'm forgetting the word, for Stephen's book that we will include in your follow-up if you would like to purchase this paperback uh, of Stephen's book, The Art of Solitude. Really wonderful. And he actually covers topics we didn't even get to in, in our conversation today. So really wide-ranging. Stephen, I don't know if you can see all of the chats coming through that are thanking you. Yeah, uh, I can see it. Yeah, okay. it's, it's working quite well now. Yeah, okay. I can see this. Murphy's Law, right. Okay, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank yes. you. We will see you next time. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.